strength, it is my duty to fight. As the Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 34, that God has given more strength to women, it is his duty to protect the women. So in strength, the men have a degree of advantage. And the other example I gave earlier, that where companionship of the children is concerned for the parents, the women have three times more companionship as compared to men. The mother has three times more companionship as compared to father. So here, the women have a degree of advantage. So as I said earlier, men and women in Islam are equal. In some aspects, the women have a degree of advantage. In some aspects, the men have a degree of advantage. The foundation of the religion of Islam is the belief in one and only sole creator and sustainer. And this creator and sustainer almighty God is the same for all the human beings. Only if you agree that our creator, sustainer and cherisher, one God is the same, then only can brotherhood be maintained in all religions. And this is the basis of all the religions. Religion, according to Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal God or gods that deserve worship and obedience. So according to Oxford Dictionary, religion means belief in God. If you understand God, you understand that religion in the right perspective. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse number 64, Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah na'buda illallah. That you worship none but one almighty God. So the Quran says, let the people of different religions come to common terms. What is different, we can discuss tomorrow. Let us agree to follow what is common. And one thing common in all the religion is to believe and worship only one God. To understand any religion or to understand the concept of God in a religion, it is not appropriate to try and observe the followers of that religion. Because many a time the followers themselves may not be aware about the religion or the concept of the God in religion. The best and the most authentic way of understanding a religion or understanding the concept of God in a religion is to try and understand what the authentic scriptures of that religion has to speak about God. Let's try and understand the concept of God in the major religions in the nutshell. First, we'll try to understand the concept of God in Hinduism. The two major and most authentic scriptures in the religion of Hinduism are the Vedas and the Upanishads. It's mentioned in the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number 6, section number 2, verse number 1. Ikkam evidityam. God is only one without a second. This is a Sanskrit quotation. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setar Upanishad, chapter number 6, verse number 9. Nacha sikasaj, janitana chadipa. Of that God, he has got no parents, he has got no Lord, he has got no father, he has got no mother, he has got no superior. It's mentioned in the Sveta Setar Upanishad, chapter number 4, verse number 19, as well as Yajur Ved, chapter number 32, verse number 3. Na tasyapatima asti. Of that God, there is no Pratima. Pratima is a Sanskrit word which means, it means an image, a photograph, a painting, a picture, a sculpture, a statue, an idol. It says, of that God, there is no image, there is no picture, there is no painting, there is no portrait, there is no statue, there is no idol, there is no sculpture. And the Brahma Sutra of Hinduism, the fundamental creed of Hinduism is, Ekam Brahm Devutya Naste, Nena Naste Kinchan, Bhagwan Eki hai, Dusra Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Nahi hai, Zara bhi Nahi hai. There is only one God, not a second one. Not at all, not at all, not in the least bit. So if you read the Hindu scriptures, you shall understand the concept of God in Hinduism and understand Hinduism in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Judaism. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, says, Shama Israelo. That your, O Lord, your Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 43, verse number 11. I, I am Lord, and there's no Savior besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, 
chapter number 45, verse number 5. I am Lord and there's none else, there's no God besides me. It's mentioned in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 45, chapter number 46, verse number 9. I am God and there's none else. I am God and there's none like me. It's further mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 2 to 5, as well as in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9. Almighty God says, Thou shalt have no other God besides me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image of anything, of any likeness in the heaven above, in the earth beneath, in the water beneath the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor serve them, for I, thy God, thy Lord, is a jealous God. So if you read the Old Testament or if you read the Torah, you shall understand the concept of God in Judaism and understand Judaism in the right perspective. Before we discuss the concept of God in Christianity, I would like to clarify a few points. Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. We believe he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. The Christians and the Muslims, we are going together. One may ask, then where is the parting of ways? The parting of ways is that many Christians believe, or most of the Christians believe, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. They believe that he was Almighty God. In fact, if you read the Bible, there is not a single unequivocal statement. There is not a single unambiguous statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God, or where he says worship me. In fact, if you read the Bible, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20, I with the finger of God cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30, I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, is a Muslim. As I mentioned, Muslim means a person who submits his will to God. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, not my will, but the will of Almighty God. So in Arabic we say he's Muslim. Therefore we say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of Almighty God. And he further clarified in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24, he said that the words that you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, This is life eternal so that you may know one true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says, Amen of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles and signs, which God did by him and you are witness to it. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandment, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him, earlier. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shama Israelo Adna Hainu Adna Ikhad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. So if you read the Bible, you should understand the concept of God in Christianity and understand Christianity in the right perspective. Let's discuss the concept of God in Islam. The best reply that any Muslim can give you regarding the concept of God in Islam is quote to you Surah Ikhlas. That is chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah hu samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yilid wa lam yulad. He begets not nor is begotten. Wa lam yakul law kufanat. There is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Almighty God. Any person says so and so candidate is God. If he falls in, if he passes this four test, we Muslims have got no objection in accepting as God. The first is, say he is one and only. The second is, he should be absolute and eternal. 
The third, he begets not nor is he begotten. And fourth, that nothing like unto him anything in this world. This is a four line definition of Almighty God, which we call as the litmus test for theology. It is the touchstone of theology. And further, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, that revile not, abuse not those who they worship God besides Allah. Let, lest in the ignorance they will revile, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Quran prohibits any Muslim from speaking bad, from reviling, from abusing those who other people worship God besides Allah. Lest in the ignorance they will abuse Allah. So to understand the concept of God in Islam, we have to read the Quran. Today, unfortunately, Islam is the most misunderstood religion in the world. The religion which has the maximum misconception in the world today, it is Islam. And one of the reasons for these misconceptions about this religion, I would say it is the media. Today we find in the international media, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. We find in the international newspapers, in the international magazine, on the radio broadcast stations, on the international satellite channels, on the internet, there is virulent propaganda regarding Islam. And the most misunderstood word regarding Islam, it is the word Jihad. It is not only misunderstood by the Muslims, because of the media, it's also misunderstood by the non-Muslims. Today, most of the people, whether they are Muslims or non-Muslims, they think that any war fought by any Muslim for any reason, whether it be for personal gain, whether it be for name, whether it be for fame, whether it be for honor, whether it be for land, any war fought by any Muslim is called as jihad. Jihad does not mean any war fought by any Muslim for any reason. Jihad comes from the Arabic word jihada, which means to strive, which means to struggle. In the Islamic context, jihad means to strive and struggle against one's own evil inclination. Jihad also means to strive and struggle to make the society better. Jihad also means to strive and struggle against oppression. Jihad also means to strive and struggle in self-defense. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. For example, if a student is striving and struggling to pass in the examination, in Arabic we will say he is doing jihad. So jihad basically means to strive and struggle. Today, most of the Orientalists, they translate the word jihad as holy war. If you translate holy war into Arabic, it is harbu muqaddasa. And this word harbu muqaddasa appears nowhere in the Quran, nowhere in any things of the Prophet Muhammad This word holy war, if you go back into history, was first used for the Crusades. When the Crusaders, they forced people to accept the religion of Christianity by force. And unfortunately today, it is used for the Muslims and Islam. Quran mentions explicitly in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32. If anyone kills any other human being, unless it be for murder or for spreading corruption in the land, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. The Quran says, if any human being kills any other innocent human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has killed the whole of humanity. And the verse continues, if anyone saves any human being, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though he has saved the whole of humanity. I, being a student of comparative religion, I have not come across any verse in any scripture besides the Quran which is so explicit against terrorism against killing innocent human being. It says that if any human being kills any other human being who is innocent, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have killed the whole of humanity. And I have not come across any verse in any other scripture, any other religious scripture besides the Quran, which promotes the prevention of terrorism. And it says, if any human being saves any human life, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, it is as though you have saved the whole of humankind. 